is only one wound, and we are all bleeding from it. My name is Roman Oladimbolu. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, uh, a storyteller, an artist, uh, using words and images to tell stories and to be able to communicate with people, like trying to use my work to inform people um, about themselves, uh, about, about the world, how things are going, how we, how we make up the world ourselves, how we determine uh, things uh, within the space that we live. And if that leads to peace, you know, uh, I think it's great. In fact, I know that things like that will definitely lead to peace because it's the same way that what happened to me uh, in my life, being able to realize uh, who I was, where I was coming from, what all of these things mean, and being able to see myself as um, having relationship through all the different identities that uh, that I have, that the world confers on me, and uh, and people being a, for being able to realize that and be able to step back from that and and look at how those they, either from the main identity or all the other identities how they relate with people in the world how they create what becomes reality of our world, uh, you know how all of these things. Uh, come together for me to be able to really see the world the way the world is. I think it's very, very important. It helped me to be able to get to the stage where I am, where I can actually look at things in a uh, in, in more constructive way rather than uh, to accept them in, in the destructive uh, uh, manner that things tend to go. I started on this project uh, simply because I was, I experienced the conflict that I made a movie about because this, it, the events in the movie happened when I was in college and it was between all of them were my friends, uh, the Arab students and the Jewish students and then you have the pro-Palestinian uh, 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 students, people from other parts of the world who are pro-Palestinian and people, some other people who are pro-Israelis. Everyone was uh, at loggerheads and the tension was rising in my, in my college at the time, and we had to do something, um, uh, which I, together with some of my friends, we came together to be able to try to do it. And, and the students themselves, some of the, the leaders of, what we can consider the leaders of the two sides were also with me, also striving to be able to come together, which was an interesting thing to see that what we were going through on campus at the time was completely different from the narrative that we see in the media. On the, uh, the final day of the whole experience on campus, what happened, uh, yeah, we, we didn't solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but something happened that inspired every one of us. And I remember it was an evening in, we were in the library. Students who were from all different parts of the world all came together realizing the magnitude of what just happened. And everyone came together. Everyone, people who were not part of the whole process of trying to bring the two sides together, but everyone saw the impact of what happened that evening and they converged. Uh, uh, at the library on that day and it was very touching and I remember someone saying uh, oh Raman you should make this into a movie and everyone laughed it wouldn't be until I about 10 years when uh, after I made my first film Soul Sisters that it just occurred to me that I had to make this film I had to tell this story so that it could uh, 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 get to people beyond the walls of the campus at the time. And that was when I started to put the, uh, the story together. And I realized that the opportunity that telling the story offers me was something to be able to understand the problems that we, that the problems that we as humans have creating the conflicts that we find ourselves within. It took me a while writing the scripts. It took me about two and a half to three years writing the script, not just because the script was difficult to, read, to write because I was writing about what happened, but I wanted to understand the conflict more. I wanted to know what was going on in the Middle East. 
And because I also realized that this project was not, uh, uh, this conflict was not just something that was localized to the Middle East the way most people tend to think. It was a, a river bridge all over the world. Uh, for example, when I started making the film, I remember I went to Nigeria uh, for a, a short visit sometime uh, in between while I was still working on the project. And uh, where I was staying, my sisters, my friends, a bunch of people came to visit me. And somebody asked about the project that I was working on. And I told, you know, I was about to tell them where we were with the project, but the the, the arguments that started by the fact of that the subject was Israel-Palestine conflict, um, who were, it went beyond me. Uh, you had, because mo mo uh, uh, the people who were there in the room, you had Muslims, you had Christians, and people tend to look at these things from the points of view of their religions. And uh, I was the one that came to visit. I stepped outside the room. Nobody noticed that I was outside the room because they were fiercely arguing among one another. And uh, so, uh, in a way, you see how uh, it, it shows how uh, people in other parts of the world as well, that the effect of this conflict in the Middle East, how it reverberates, because the, uh, uh, the two major religions that have spread around the world, Islam and Christianity, they both originate from these parts, this uh, Middle East, and their story, the stories we are dealing with is tied together with these two religions. I want to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Oh, good. I think it's time we admit what's going on there. That God has only been using the Muslims to punish the Jews. Why? Because they killed Jesus? The Jews didn't kill Jesus, the Romans did. You should be happy they did anyway. Without that, there's no Christianity. Hey, can you all just listen? When it's your turn, you can say whatever you like. I want to show how the Jews broke God's covenant, which is why they were cast out of their land and persecuted for thousands of years. This is a joke. And how now God has forgiven them so they can come back to their land before Christ comes back. That sounds to me like a ridiculous speech. Ridiculous and dangerous. This is a free speech class. Every student has a right to his or her own opinion. <laughs> Even if it's that inflammatory? Even so. Really? Maybe if we learn to handle such things here, we'll have less parochial leaders in the future. You will all have your own time to counter an argument that you might disagree with. Making theory of conflict was a, a real eye-opener for me, something that uh, helped refocus the whole uh, 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 venture of making films. I remember during the process of writing and pre-production, and during the production, there were an intense moments that uh, things that happened uh, were things that stayed with every one of us, you know, for, I'm sure will stay with us for a very long time. Um, but they were inspiring, educative. Uh, people were educated about the conflict, how we are all connected with conflict, however it's going on from any part of the world, and how these conflicts are just representations of what we ourselves, what we are and what we are doing. And, uh, and, and it, it speaks to the importance of uh, us having to come together to be able to take care of the problems that we have in the world because it is our world and we really need to uh, do something about it. What the hell is going on here? Maybe. As long as they continue to hate each other, people are going to take sides in the fight. I think that's an oversimplification. People don't just hate each other like that. You think so? It's all about land and identity. <laughs> what else does people fight for? In 1948, it was Israel that wanted a piece of the land, but the Arabs wanted all of it. Today, it's the Arabs that wanted peace, and Israel seems to want to keep it all.
Hi everyone, my name is Juliana Uribe. I'm the founder and CEO of Mobilizatorio, and I'm also the co-founder of an initiative called Colombia Cares for Colombia. Uh, and I'm here to tell you a story about how in Colombia uh, a movement and a big alliance for solidarity grew uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and about the lessons learned. So first I want to tell you where Colombia was in 2019 before everything started. Uh, on the end of November, there were many national strikes against the government taking place. There were different sectors of society that were pledging the government. They were demanding for the implementation of the peace agreement with the FARC, uh, which was signed by the previous president. Uh, people were also asking to design a concrete strategy to fight the systematic murder of social leaders and to protect the environment uh, uh, in Colombia, amongst many other issues. The government was reluctant to listen to the citizens at the beginning, but uh, there was so much pressure that at the end the government decided to open a national conversation where some of these organizations that were mobilizing came together and uh, started talking with the government in what was called the great national conversation. But exactly the week in which this national conversation should have ended, we were all waiting for all of these initiatives um, to conclude and to understand what was the position on the government and what kind of agreements had been reached. Uh, and in the middle of this polarization is when COVID hit and in mid-March the quarantine uh, started. It lasted until the end of September, which meant that it has been one of the longest quarantines um, in the world. So in the middle of this uh, polarization, we realized that we were hitting a major crisis uh, for the country. Some of the studies were saying that if we didn't do anything, uh, we will have a regression of 20 years in poverty and inequality measures, which means going back 20 years. Uh, and we were very worried as citizens and as civil society. So there was a generalized fear that we wouldn't be able to come together and work together because of the polarization. But in the middle of this, uh, with some other people and many other organizations, we decided to, to, to start a big movement for solidarity in Colombia, a movement that will bring people together to, to send a message of positiveness, of collaboration, and also to specifically uh, mobilize resources to give aid to those that were most uh, needed. So we decided to come together and surpass the challenge of COVID-19. Uh, and the solidarity movement that was created with civil society, with the private sector, began to emerge in mid-March. Speedily and in a very articulated ma matter, the main negative effects of the pandemic on crucial sectors like health, education, food security and economy were identified and some of the biggest companies in the country with profound know-how in these sectors were willing to cooperate to together face the pandemic in the best possible manner. We created a brand that is called Colombia Cuida Colombia or Colombia Cares for Colombia and we started positioning these brands as something that would unite us all. Two weeks after the alliance was formed, we already had a common identity and something that we all felt that we were a part of. As you can imagine, technology has been a big part of all of the work that we have been doing because we started using social media, using a website that allowed us to crowdfund, partnering with many other crowdsourcing and crowdfunding platforms. And we started also partnering with artists, singers, companies, foundations, and civil sector. And all of them started using this brand and started working together to fundraise for Colombia Cares for Colombia to give aid to those that were most in need. So with all the help of all these many people, the Colombia Cares for Colombia brand expanded like wildfire. Then we decided to organize, to build momentum and organize a one 
uh, day event that was on May 1st. Uh, and the key partners here were all the media in Colombia. TV, radio, printed press, digital press joined with, for two main purposes. Reaching Colombia with a message of hope and solidarity during the COVID-19 crisis in a moment in which all of us were suffering and were in the middle of uncertainty. And also fundraising to continue to provide aid in food security and health to those that were in greatest needs. We had amazing results. Just in one day, we hit an audience of six million people that watched the event live through social media and through TV. We reached over 2.8 billion people on social media and people in more than 110 countries were able to see our event. In turn, we were able to raise support for over $12 million in cash and in kind. And that was very important for the movement and a great way to give people. After that, we continue to build uh, many other campaigns. Uh, we continue to build campaigns that have been to take care of yourself, to, get, to continue donating, to, for kids to continue their education. Uh, of course, we build a self-care campaign in order for people to use their masks. So we have continued to build this movement and this communication strategy. And today, we're a movement that unites 400 organizations from civil society and the private sector and over 50,000 people who have donated uh, to our cause. Some of the most important lessons learned have been that technology is key to participation and consequently mobilization. And this is something that we here in Build Peace uh, know because many of us work on this, uh, but uh, it was great to know that existing platforms could be activated within days for reaching people, for organizing people. We also organize volunteers networks uh, using technology. Uh, the second lesson learned is that mobilization was quick thanks to previous and well-nurtured networks with allies. Uh, there were existing uh, relationships and building on those relationships was great to activate the network and be able to move fast. Um, another one of the lessons learned is that we, since the beginning, needed to activate the network, but think long term, think this beyond a specific communications plan campaign and more like a long term alliance and a long term strategy that will actually bring people together. So at the end, we are still waiting for the results of the national conversation. We still have so many issues in Colombia that divide us and that we are waiting uh, uh, to see what will happen with the peace building, with the killing of social leaders, with the environment. We still have organizations and people that think differently and we're still facing all of this. But we are very proud that even in a country where we are, there are issues that divide us. During COVID, we were able to come together, to work together, to unite, to help those who were most in need, and to actually show the country that civil society and private sector are a big part of the solution uh, to our most uh, important issues, and that when we come together, we can achieve a huge impact. To date, we have helped over 2 million people with uh, bringing them food and health. And it, we are very proud of the achievement and nothing of this would have been, we had been able to do alone as one organization. The success of this has been, uh, as I mentioned, to come together and to build trust, to nurture the network, to activate the network. If you want to know more, you can reach me at, at Juliana Uribe on Twitter. You can check our website, www.colombiacuidacolombia.com. And I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. My name is Lainey Lennox, and today I'm going to speak to you about what I learned about democracy from conducting dialogue-style interviews for my PhD fieldwork. So in November of 2019, 
I traveled to Berlin to begin my fieldwork for my PhD thesis, which primarily consisted of conducting dialogue style interviews with political prisoners that had been inc incarcerated in the former East Germany or the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, and that had since their imprisonment participate, participated in memorialization projects surrounding their prison experience. So these were often oral history projects or in some cases temporary museum exhibits or traveling to schools to speak in history classes to school children about their experience, which in German memorial culture it's called eyewitness testimony and has been a really valued part of remembering the past in Germany since they began to memorialize the Holocaust and the Second World War history. So conducting these types of interviews taught me something really important about the potential of democratic practice, particularly if we can think about democratic practice not just as the top-down governing structures, but as something that can happen from below and that we can all begin to incorporate in our kind of everyday lives and the way that we conduct work. So the my arrival in Berlin also coincided with the 30th Mauerfall Festival, which celebrated the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I was really intrigued by the way they memorialized as part of their recent past because it really wasn't trying to to establish a singular narrative of events but rather did this really kind of pluralistic type of memorialization where different historical sites in the city had temporary museum exhibits as well as public lectures as well as oral history exhibits and things like that and it was really too much for one person to attend everything so as an individual, you really had to curate your experience. So you could, you know, go to the East Side Gallery, for example, like I did, and attend a talk on what it was like to immigrate to the to GDR during the Cold War. Or you could go to a talk about how, imagining a new future for Berlin and, Berlin and how much that depended on our present, or Berlin's present and also its past. So it's this really dynamic memorialization experience that really felt like having a dialogue or a conversation with the city and really put the onus, I think, on us as individuals to engage and to build understanding in this dynamic way that really asked us to let go of kind of our singular notions of the way history happens and the way that we consider the past. So this, this first photo here on the slide, I took from one of the temporary exhibits at the Marfall Festival and it looks like a more traditional timeline, but it's actually a map of the U5 subway line in Berlin. And each of the points are points that are stops along that line. And the photos and the text that you see around it is historical site, you know, historical events and things that relate to that site. And it's not it's not just relaying historical events from the Cold War, but also from the Second World War and even earlier in the 20th century in Berlin's history. So it's really asking us to consider history as a sort of nonlinear thing and think about how the past relates to our present and also our future and how to, and other parts of the past. And this is very similar to the experience that I had conducting dialogue interviews with my participants. The dialogue interview process differs from a more structured and traditional interview process in a few key ways. Primarily, it really focuses and centers the participant themselves as a whole individual. So rather than going into the space with the dialogue space with these predetermined questions, I more went with themes and things that I wanted to talk about. And I let the participants tell me what they thought was most important around those themes rather than leading them in certain directions with questions. And I also let them dictate how long they wanted to spend with me, which really ranged anywhere from an hour to a couple of days. And had I been able to complete my fieldwork, which was cut short due to the pandemic, I'd imagine I would have met up with the same people um, regularly as well and had even more time. But unfortunately, I didn't. So engaging with these people's life stories in this nuanced way really got me to think about how we can think of democracy, because I really, in going into these interviews, what I wanted to understand was how this sort of pluralistic understanding of history that you have to adopt when you engage in a singular person's life can tell us about how we can democratize societies more broadly. So before I go into, I've got a couple of graphs to explain how we normally think about democracy versus how I'm sort of advocating that we think about it. 
But before I go into that, I would like to explain how I'm considering when I talk about democracy, what I mean, really, which is based primarily on two political theorists, Jacques Rancière and Chantal Mouffe. Jacques Rancière considers democracy as the widening of the public sphere. And what he means by this is that it's the kind of widening of opportunity for individual citizens and sort of average people to participate in the structures that are impacting their lives. So when he's talking about democracy sort of as, as this overarching governing thing, but I'd like us to also think about what this can mean if we incorporate that kind of participatory ethos to other aspects of our lives. Um, so that's Rancier. And then Chantal Mouffe is advocating for an agonistic type of democracy that institutionalizes dissent and asks that we consider democracy as this ongoing conversation without end. So if we think about democracy as the conversation that we're having about how to reach kind of our best possible futures, as soon as we close that conversation, we close, close the opportunity for people to participate, which means that we've really closed off the democratic process itself. So I will just show you the first graph. Here. Okay, so this first graph that I have here is how we would think of sort of an ideal representative democracy. So that's the, you know, the type of democracy that's most common now. So where we have elective represent representatives that speak on our behalf. So the y-axis at the top, I have a smiley face just to represent sort of, you know, general positive outcomes, let's say from democracy. So just good things happening in society. The bottom of the y-axis, the frowny face is just the opposite, bad things happening. And then on the x-axis, I have a stopwatch to represent time. And then the purple line is representative of the democratic process itself. So we tend to think of democracy as a sort of linear progression towards, let's say, a general good. And it's just our elected representatives are speaking on our behalf and it's sort of just chugging along in this very clean uh, way towards, towards a general good. Whereas I'm arguing for a much more direct participatory democratic process. And again, we don't need to think of this necessarily in terms of just governing structures, but I'll, I'll go into that more in a moment. But as you can see, the purple, again, still representing the democratic process is a lot messier, but I'm really arguing that it has to be to be a more inclusive and direct process. So if you think back to me doing my dialogue interviews and really engaging in the lives of individuals and what that kind of helped me understand in terms of a, a more nuanced understanding of, of history, really, and a more in that way, it's a more complete story. I'm arguing that for democracy to be a more complete story and to include more of us in its process, it has to be this sort of non-linear, you know, I mean, that line is sort of still generally progressing towards a good, we hope, of course, but it's it's this messy, much messier and complex thing. And then on the x-axis, I've replaced the stopwatch with this feedback loop to represent Chantal Mousse's ongoing process. So really, getting away from the idea that, that our democratic work is going to have any kind of end point and really prioritizing the process itself and understanding that the way that we conduct the process is incredibly important in terms of making it more inclusive and participatory. So I wanted to end my presentation with a consideration of this photo of stumbling stones, which a lot of people may be familiar with, they're common in Germany and in part, other parts of Europe that were was occupied by Germany during the Second World War. And they commemorate spaces where Jews were deported. And they I love them because they, they really ask people to engage with a really difficult past just as, as they're going about their everyday. And I think that as the Black Lives Matter protests and the conversations around difficult histories around slavery and around how we in the U.S. have, have treated black people in general through through generations have, have shown us is that it's, it's really vital that we contend with difficult histories and that we do so in a very real way, in a nuanced way. I think that it, as we start to understand memorialization processes as democratic processes, it gives us a really good example of how we can enact democracy from below and how we can really incorporate democratic practice in our daily lives and lived experiences and in our work, as I've tried to do with my own research. And in the current global context that in many ways seems very bleak when fascism is, is on the rise, 
and you know seems to be sort of this the specter surrounding a lot of a lot of politics today i would encourage us to think about while voting is really important i i think it's very easy for us to feel disempowered and discouraged i would just encourage us to think about how we can really live in more democratic and participatory ways and consider even just our everyday conversations as dialogue processes and i think that's really kind of a source of hope for me to think about how I can just live my daily life embodying these values. So thank you very much.